The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by John Dryden, Book One. Arms, and the man I sing, who, forced by fate, and haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, expelled and exiled, left the Trojan shore. Long labours, both by sea and land, he bore, and in the doubtful war, before he won, the Latian realm, and built the destined town, his banished gods restored to rites divine, and settled sure succession in his line, from whence the race of Alban fathers come, and the long glories of majestic Rome. O muse, the causes and the crimes relate, what goddess was provoked, and whence her hate, for what offence the queen of heaven began to persecute so brave and just a man, involved his anxious life in endless cares, exposed to wants and hurried into wars. Can heavenly minds such high resentment show, or exercise their spite in human woe? Against the Tiber's mouth, but far away, an ancient town was seated on the sea. A Tyrian colony the people made, stout for war and studious of their trade. Carthage the name, beloved by Juno more than her own Argos or the Samian shore. Here stood her chariot, here, if heaven were kind, the seat of awful empire she designed. Yet she had heard an ancient rumour fly long sighted by the people of the sky, that times to come should see the Trojan race, her Carthage ruin and her towers deface, nor thus confined the yoke of sovereign sway should on the necks of all the nations lay. She pondered this and feared it was in fate, nor could forget the war she'd waged of late for conquering Greece against the Trojan state. Besides, long causes working in her mind, and secret seeds of envy lay behind. Deep graven in her heart the doom remained, of partial Paris and her form disdained, the grace bestowed on ravished Ganymede, Electra's glories and her injured bed. Each was a cause alone, and all combined, to kindle vengeance in her haughty mind. For this, far distant from the Latian coast, she drove the remnants of the Trojan host, and seven long years the unhappy wandering train were tossed by storms and scattered through the main. Such time, such toil, required the Roman name, such length of labour for so vast a frame. Now scarce the Trojan fleet, with sails and oars, had left behind the fair Sicilian shores, entering with cheerful shouts the watery rain, and ploughing frothy furrows in the main, when, labouring still with endless discontent, the Queen of Heaven did thus her fury vent. Then am I vanquished, must I yield, said she, and must the Trojans reign in Italy? So fate will have it, and Jove adds his force, nor can my power divert their happy course. Could angry Pallas with revengeful spleen the Grecian navy burn and drown the men? She, for the fault of one offending foe, the bolts of Jove himself presumed to throw. With whirlwinds from beneath she tossed the ship, and bare exposed the bosom of the deep. Then, as an eagle gripes the trembling game, the wretch, set hissing with her father's flame, she strongly seized, and with a burning wound, transfixed and naked, on a rock she bound. But I, who walk in awful state above, the majesty of heaven, the sister-wife of Jove, for lengths of years my fruitless force employ, against the thin remains of ruined Troy. What nations now to Juno's power will pray, or offerings on my slighted altars lay? 
Thus ragged the goddess, and with fury fraught, The restless regions of the storms she sought, Where, in a spacious cave of living stone, The tyrant Aeolus from his airy throne, With power imperial curbs the struggling winds, And sounding tempests in dark prisons binds, This way and that the impatient captives tend, and pressing for release the mountains rend. High in his hall the undaunted monarch stands, and shakes his scepter and their rage commands, which did he not their unresisted sway, would sweep the world before them in their way. Earth, air, and seas through empty space would roll, and heaven would fly before the driving soul. In fear of this, the father of the gods confined their fury to these dark abodes, and locked them safe within, oppressed with mountain loads, imposed a king with arbitrary sway, to loose their fetters or their force allay, to whom the suppliant queen her prayers addressed, and thus the tenor of her suit expressed. O Aeolus, for to thee the king of heaven, the power of tempests and of winds has given, thy force alone their fury can restrain, and smooth the waves or swell the troubled main. A race of wandering slaves abhorred by me, with prosperous passage cut the Tuscan sea, to fruitful Italy their course they steer, and for their vanquished gods design new temples there. Raise all thy winds, with night involve the skies, Sink or disperse my fatal enemies. Twice seven the charming daughters of the main, Around my person wait and bear my train. Succeed my wish, and second my design, The fairest Diopia shall be thine, And make thee father of a happy line. To this the god, tis yours, O queen, to will, The work which duty binds me to fulfill. These airy kingdoms and this wide command Are all the presence of your bounteous hand. Yours is my sovereign's grace, and as your guest I sit with gods at their celestial feast. Raise tempests at your pleasure, or subdue, Dispose of empire which I hold from you. He said, and hurled against the mountainside, His quivering spear, and all the god applied. The raging winds rush through the hollow wound, And dance aloft in air, and skim across the ground. Then, settling on the sea, the surges sweep, Raise liquid mountains, and disclose the deep. South, east, and west with mixed confusion roar, And roll the foaming billows to the shore. The cables crack, the sailors' fearful cries, Ascend, and sable night involves the skies, And heaven itself is ravished from their eyes. Loud peals of thunder from the poles ensue, Then flashing fires the transient light renew. The face of things a frightful image bears, And present death in various forms appears. Struck with unusual fright, the Trojan chief, With lifted hands and eyes, invokes relief, And thrice and four times happy those, he cried, That under Ilian walls, before their parents died. Tydides, bravest of the Grecian train, Why could not I by that strong arm be slain, And lie by rise, and mount the tossing vessels to the skies? Nor can the shivering oars sustain the blow, The galley gives her side and turns her prow. While those astern, descending down the steep, Through gaping waves behold the boiling deep, Three ships were hurried by the southern blast, And on the secret shelves with fury cast, Those hidden rocks the Orgeonian sailors knew, They called them altars when they rose in view and showed their spacious backs above the flood, three more fierce Euros in his angry mood, dashed on the shallows of the moving sand, and in mid-ocean left them moored a land. 
Arontes' bark that bore the Lycian crew, a horrid sight, even in the hero's view. From stem to stern by waves was overborne, the trembling pilot from his rudder torn, was headlong hurled, thrice round the ship was tossed, then bulged at once, and in the deep was lost. And here and there above the waves were seen, arms, pictures, precious goods, and floating men. The stoutest vessel to the storm gave way, and sucked through loosened planks the rushing sea. Ilionius was her chief, Alethes old, Arcates faithful, Arbus young and bold, endured no less their ships with gaping seams admit the deluge of the briny streams. Meantime, imperial Neptune heard the sound of raging billows breaking on the ground. Displeased and fearing for his watery reign, he reared his awful head above the main. Serene in majesty, then rolled his eyes around the space of earth and seas and skies. He saw the Trojan fleet dispersed, distressed, by stormy winds and wintry heaven oppressed. Full well the god his sister's envy knew, and what her aims and what her arts pursue. He summoned Uros and the western blast, and first an angry glance on both he cast, and thus rebuked, audacious winds, from whence this bold attempt, this rebel insolence, is it for you to ravage seas and land, unauthorized by my supreme command? To raise such mountains on the troubled main? Whom I but first is fit the billows to restrain, and then you shall be taught obedience to my reign. Hence to your lord my royal mandate bear, the realms of ocean and the fields of air are mine, not his, by fatal lot to me, the liquid empire fell, and trident of the sea. His power to hollow caverns is confined. There let him reign, the jailer of the wind. With hoarse commands his breathing subjects call, and boast and bluster in his empty call. He spoke, and while he spoke he smoothed the sea, dispelled the darkness, and restored the day. Chimotheo, Triton, and the sea-green train of beauteous nymphs, the daughters of the main, clear from the rocks the vessels with their hands, the god himself with ready trident stands, and opes the deep, and spreads the moving sands, then heaves them off the shoals, wherever he guides his finny courses, and in triumph rides, the waves unruffle, and the sea subsides, as when in tumults rise the ignoble crowd, mad are their motions, and their tongues are loud, and stones and brands in rattling volleys fly, and all the rusting arms that fury can supply. If then some grave and pious man appear, they hush their noise and lend a listening ear. He soothes with sober words their angry mood, and quenches their innate desire of blood. So when the father of the flood appears, and o'er the seas his sovereign trident rears, their fury falls, he skims the liquid plains, high on his chariot and with loosened reins, majestic moves along and awful peace maintains. The weary Trojans ply their shattered oars to nearest land and make the Libyan shores. Within a long recess there lies a bay, an island shades it from the rolling sea, and forms a port secure for ships to ride, broke by the jutting land on either side, in double streams the briny waters glide. Betwixt two rows of rocks a sylvan scene appears above and groves for ever green. A grot is formed beneath with mossy seats, to rest the nereids and exclude the heats, down through the crannies of the living walls, the crystal streams descend in murmuring falls. No hawsers need to bind the vessels here, nor bearded anchors for no storms they fear. Seven ships within this happy harbour meet, 
the thin remainders of the scattered fleet. The Trojans, worn with toils and spent with woes, leap on the welcome land and seek their wished repose. First, good Achates, with repeated strokes, of clashing flints their hidden fire provokes. Short flame succeeds, a bed of withered leaves, the dying sparkles in their fall receives. Caught into life, in fiery fumes they rise, and fed with stronger food, invade the skies. The Trojans, dropping wet, or stand around, the cheerful blaze, or lie along the ground. Some dry their corn, infected with the brine, then grind with marvels, and d prepare to dine. Aeneas climbs the mountain's airy brow, and takes a prospect of the seas below. If Capys thence, or Antheus he could spy, or see the streamers of Cacus fly, no vessels were in view, but on the plain, three steamy stags command a lordly train, of branching heads the more ignoble throng attend their stately steps and slowly graze along. He stood, and while secure they fed below, he took the quiver and the trusty bow, Achates used to bear, the leaders first he laid along, and then the vulgar pierced, nor ceased his arrows till the shady plain, seven mighty bodies with their blood disdain. For the seven ships he made an equal share, and to the port returned, triumphant from the war, the jars of generous wine, Ascates' gift, when his Trinacrian shores the navy left. He set a brooch, and for the feast prepared, in equal portions with the venison shared. Thus while he dealt it round, the pious chief, with cheerful words, allayed the common grief. Endure and conquer, Jove will soon dispose, to future good, our past and present woes. With me, the rocks of Scylla, you have tried, the inhuman Cyclops, and his den defied. What greater ills hereafter can you bear? Resume your courage, and dismiss your care. And hour will come, with pleasure to relate your sorrows past as benefits of fate. Through various hazards and events we move to Latium and the realms foredoomed by Jove. Called to the seat, the promise of the skies, where Trojan kingdoms once again may rise. Endure the hardships of your present state. Live and reserve yourselves for better fate. These words he spoke, but spoke not from his heart. His outward smiles concealed his inward smart. The jolly crew, unmindful of the past, the quarry share their plenteous dinner haste. Some strip the skin, some portion out the spoil, the limbs yet trembling in the cauldron's boil. Some on the fire the reekling entrails broil, Stretched on the grassy turf at ease they dine, Restore their strength with meat, and cheer their souls with wine. Their hunger thus appeased, their care attends, The doubtful fortune of their absent friends. Alternate hopes and fears their minds possess, Whether to deem them dead or in distress. Above the rest, Aeneas mourns the fate of brave Orontes and the uncertain state of Gaius, Lycus, and of Amicus. The day, but not their sorrows, ended thus. When from aloft almighty Jove surveys earth, air, and shores, and navigable seas, at length on Libyan realms he fixed his eyes, whom, pondering thus on human miseries, when Venus saw she with the lowly look, not free from tears, her heavenly sire bespoke. O king of gods and men, whose awful hand disperses thunder on the seas and land, disposing all with absolute command, how could my pious son thy power incense? Or what, alas, is vanished Troy's offence? Our hope of Italy not only lost, on various seas by various tempests tossed, but shut from every shore and barred from every coast. You promised once a progeny divine, 
of Romans rising from the Trojan line, in after times should hold the world in awe, and to the land and ocean give the law. How is your doom reversed, which eased my care, when Troy was ruined in that cruel war? Then fates to fates I could oppose, but now, when fortune still pursues her former blow, what can I hope, what worse can still succeed? What end of labours has your will decreed? Antenor, from the midst of Grecian hosts, could pass secure and pierce the Illyrian coasts, where, travelling down the steep, Timavus raves, and through nine channels disembogues his waves. At length he founded Padua's happy seat, and gave his Trojans a secure retreat. There fixed their arms, and there renewed their name, and there in quiet rules, and crowned with fame. But we, descended from your sacred line, entitled to your heaven and rights divine, are banished earth, and, for the wrath of one, removed from Latium and the promised throne. Are these our sceptres, these our due rewards, and is it thus that Jove his plighted faith regards? To whom the father of the immortal race, smiling with that serene, indulgent face, with which he drives the clouds and clears the skies, first gave a holy kiss, then thus replies, Daughter, dismiss thy fears to thy desire, the fates of thine are fixed and stand entire. Thou shalt behold thy wished Lavinian walls, and ripe for heaven when fate Aeneas calls, then shalt thou bear him up sublime to me. No counsels have reversed my firm decree, and, lest new fears disturb thy happy state, no, I have searched the mystic rolls of fate. Thy son, nor is the appointed season far, in Italy shall wage successful war, shall tame fierce nations in the bloody field, and sovereign laws impose and cities build, till, after every foe subdued, the sun, thrice through the signs of his annual race, shall run. This is the time prefixed, Ascanius then, now to call Illulus, shall begin his reign. He thirty rolling years the crown shall wear, then from Lavinium shall the seat transfer, and with hard labour Alba longer build. The throne with his succession shall be filled, Three hundred circuits more than shall be seen, Ilia the fair, a priestess and a queen, Who, full of Mars, in time with kindly throes, Shall at a birth to goodly boys disclose, The royal babes a tawny wolf shall drain, Then Romulus his grandsire's throne shall gain, Of martial towers the founder shall become, the people Romans call the city Rome. To them no bounds of empire I assign, nor terms of years to their immortal line. Even haughty Juno, who with endless broils, earth, seas, and heaven, and Jove himself to moils, at length atoned, her friendly power shall join to cherish and advance the Trojan line. The subject world shall Rome's dominion own, and prostrate shall adore the nation of the gown. An age is ripening in revolving fate, when Troy shall overturn the Grecian state, and sweet revenge her conquering sons shall call to crush the people that conspired her fall. Then Kaiser from the Julian stock shall rise, whose empire ocean and whose fame the skies alone shall bound, whom, fraught with eastern spoils, our heaven, the just reward of human toils, securely shall repay with rites divine, and incense shall ascend before his sacred shrine. Then dire debate and impious war shall cease, and the stern age be softened into peace. Then banished faith shall once again return, and vestal fires in hallowed temples burn, and Remus and Quirinus shall sustain the righteous laws and fraud and force restrain. 
Janus himself before his fane shall wait, And keep the dreadful issues of his gate, With bolts and iron bars within remains, Imprisoned fury bound in brazen chains. High on a trophy raised of useless arms, He sits and threats the world with vain alarms. He said, and sent Silenius with command, To free the ports and ope the Punic land, To Trojan guests, lest ignorant of fate, The queen might force them from her town and state. Down from the steep of heaven Silenius flies, And cleaves with all his wings the yielding skies. Soon on the Libyan shore descends the god, Performs his message and displays his rod, the surly murmurs of the people cease, And, as the fates required, they give the peace. The queen herself suspends the rigid laws, The Trojans pities and protects their cause. Meantime, in shades of night, Aeneas lies, Care seized his soul, and sleep forsook his eyes. But when the sun restored the cheerful day, he rose the coast and country to survey. Anxious and eager to discover more, it looked a wild, uncultivated shore. But whether humankind or beasts alone possessed the newfound region was unknown. Beneath a ledge of rocks his fleet he hides, tall trees surround the mountain's shady sides. The bending brow above a sate retreat replies, Armed with two pointed darts he leaves his friends, And true Achates on his steps attends. Lo, in the deep recesses of the wood, Before his eyes his goddess mother stood, A huntress in her habit and her mien, Her dress a maid, her air confessed a queen. Bare were her knees, and knots her garments bind, Loose was her hair, and wantoned in the wind. Her hair sustained a bow, her quiver hung behind. She seemed a virgin of the Spartan blood. With such array her policy bestrode, Her Thracian caution, and outstripped the rapid flood. Ho, strangers, have you lately seen, she said, One of my sisters, like myself arrayed, Who crossed the lawn, or in the forest strayed, a painted quiver at her back she bore, varied with spots a lynx's hide she wore, and at full cry pursued the tusky boar. Thus Venus, thus her son replied again, None of your sisters have we heard or seen. O virgin, or what other name you bear, above that style, O more than mortal fair, your voice and mien celestial birth betray, if, as you seem, the sister of the day, or one at least of chaste Diana's train, let not a humble supplicant sue in vain, but tell a stranger long in tempests tossed what earth we tread and who commands the coast. Then on your name shall wretched mortals call, and offered victims at your altars fall. I dare not, she replied, assume the name of goddess or celestial honours claim, for Tyrian virgins bows and quivers bear, and purple buskins over their ankles wear. No gentle youth in Libyan lands you are, a people rude in peace and rough in war. The rising city, which from far you see, is Carthage and a Tyrian colony. Phoenician Dido rules the growing state, who fled from Tyre to shun her brother's hate. Great were her wrongs, a story full of fate, which I will sum in short. Sicaeus, known for wealth and brother to the Punic throne, possessed fair Dido's bed, and either heart at once was wounded with an equal dart. Her father gave her yet a spotless maid, Pygmalion then the Tyrian scepter swayed one who condemned divine and human laws, then strife ensued and cursed gold the cause. The monarch, blinded with desire of wealth, with steel invades his brother's life by stealth. Before the sacred altar made him bleed, and long from her concealed the cruel deed, 
Some tale, some new pretense he daily coined To soothe his sister and delude her mind. At length, in dead of night, the ghost appears Of her unhappy lord, the spectre stares, And with erected eyes his bloody bosom bears The cruel altars and his fate he tells, And the dire secret of his house reveals. Then warns the widow with her household gods To seek a refuge in remote abodes. Last to support her in so long a way, He showed her where his hidden treasure lay. Admonished thus and seized with mortal fright, The queen provides companions of her flight. They meet and all combine to leave the state, Who hate the tyrant or who fear his hate. They seize a fleet, which ready-rigged they find, Nor is Pygmalion's treasure left behind. The vessels, heavy laden, put to sea, With prosperous winds a woman leads the way. I know not if by stress or whither driven, Or was their fatal course disposed by heaven. At last they landed, where from far your eyes May view the turrets of new Carthage rise. There bought a space of ground, which Bursa called from the bull's hide, they first enclosed and walled. But whence are you? What country claims your birth? What seek you, strangers, on our Libyan earth? To whom, with sorrow streaming from his eyes, and deeply sighing, thus her son replies, Could you with patience hear, or I relate, O nymph, the tedious annals of our fate. Through such a train of woes, if I should run, the day would sooner than the tale be done. From ancient Troy, by first expelled, we came, if you by chance have heard the Trojan name. On various seas, by various tempests tossed, at length we landed on your Libyan coast. The good Aeneas am I called, a name while fortune favoured, not unknown to fame. My household gods, companions of my woes, with pious care I rescued from our foes. To fruitful Italy my course was bent, and from the King of Heaven is my descent. With twice ten sail I crossed the Phrygian Sea, fate and my mother goddess led the way. Scarce seven the thin remainders of my fleet, from storms preserved within your harbour meet, myself distressed an exile and unknown, debarred from Europe and from Asia thrown, in Libyan deserts wander thus alone. His tender parent could no longer bear, but interposing sought to soothe his care. Whoever you are, not unbeloved by heaven, since on our friendly shore your ships are driven, have courage to the gods permit the rest, and to the queen expose your just request. Now take this earnest of success for more, your scattered fleet is joined upon the shore. The winds are changed, your friends from danger free, or I renounce my skill in augury. Twelve swans behold in beauteous order move, and stoop with closing pinions from above whom late the bird of Jove had driven along, and through the clouds pursued the scattering throng. Now, all united in a goodly team, they skim the ground and seek the quiet stream, as they, with joy returning, clap their wings, and ride the circuit of the skies in rings. Not otherwise your ships and every friend already hold the port or with swift sails to send, no more advice is needful, but pursue the path before you and the town in view. Thus having said, she turned and made appear her neck refulgent and dishevelled hair, which, flowing from her shoulders, reached the ground and widely spread ambrosial scents around. In length of train descends her sweeping gown, and by her graceful walk the queen of love is known. The prince pursued the parting deity with words like these, Ah, whither do you fly? Unkind and cruel to deceive your son, In borrowed shapes and his embrace to shun, 
never to bless my sight, but thus unknown, and still to speak in accents not your own. Against the goddess these complaints he made, but took the path, and her commands obeyed. They march, obscure, for Venus kindly shrouds, with mists their persons, and involves in clouds, that, thus unseen, their passage none might stay, or forced to tell the causes of their way. This part performed, the goddess flies sublime, to visit Paphos and her native clime, where garlands ever green and ever fair, with vows are offered and with solemn prayer. A hundred altars in her temple smoke, a thousand bleeding hearts her power invoke. They climb the next ascent, and, looking down, now at a nearer distance view the town. The prince with wonder sees the stately towers, in which late were huts and shepherds' homely bowers, the gates and streets and hears from every part, the noise and busy concourse of the mart. The toiling Tyrians on each other call, to ply their labour some extend the wall, some build the citadel, the brawny throng, or dig or push unwieldy stones along. Some for their dwellings choose a spot of ground, which first designed with ditches they surround. Some laws ordain, and some attend the choice of holy senates and elect by voice. Here some design a mole, while others there lay deep foundations for a theatre, from marble quarries mighty columns hew, for ornaments of scenes and future view. Such is their toil, and such their busy pains, as exercise the bees in flowery plains. When winter past, and summer scarce begin, invites them forth to labour in the sun. Some lead their youth abroad, while some condense their liquid store, and some in cells dispense. Some at the gate stand ready to receive, The golden burthen and their friends relieve, All with united force combine to drive The lazy drones from the laborious hive. With envy stung they view each other's deeds, The frank fragrant work with diligence proceeds. Thrice happy you, whose walls already rise, Aeneas said, and viewed with lifted eyes, their lofty towers, then, entiring at the gate, concealed in clouds, prodigious to relate, he mixed, unmarked, among the busy throng, borne by the tide and passed unseen along. Full in the centre of the town there stood, thick set with trees, a venerable wood, the Tyrians landing near this holy ground, and digging here a prosperous omen found. From under earth a courser's head they drew, their growth and future fortune to foreshew. This fated sign their foundress Juno gave, of a soil fruitful and a people brave. Sidonian Dido here with solemn state did Juno's temple build and consecrate, enriched with gifts and with a golden shrine, but more the goddess made the place divine. On brazen steps the marble threshold rose, and brazen plates the cedar beams enclose. The rafters are with brazen coverings crowned, the lofty doors on brazen hinges sound. What first Aeneas this place beheld revived his courage and his fear expelled. For while, expecting there the queen he raised, his wandering eyes and round the temple gazed, admired the fortune of the rising town, the striving artists and their arts' renown. He saw, in order painted on the wall, whatever did unhappy Troy befall. The wars that fame around the world had blown, all to the life and every leader known. There Agamemnon, Priam here, he spies, and fierce Achilles, who both kings defies. He stopped, and weeping said, O friend, even here the monuments of Trojan woes appear. Our known disasters fill even foreign lands. 
See there where old unhappy Priam stands. Even the mute walls relate the warrior's fame, and Trojan griefs the Tyrians' pity claim. He said, his tears a ready passage find, devouring what he saw so well designed, and with an empty picture fed his mind, for there he saw the fainting Grecians yield, and here the trembling Trojans quit the field, pursued by fierce Achilles through the plain, on his high chariot driving o'er the slain. The tents of Rhesus next his grief renew, by their white sails betrayed to nightly view, and wakeful Diomed, whose crew sword the sentries slew, nor spared their slumbering lord, then took the fiery steeds, ere yet the food of Troy they taste, or drink the Xanthian flood. Elsewhere he saw where Troilus defied Achilles, and unequal combat tried, then where the boy disarmed with loosened reins, was by his horses hurried o'er the plains, hung by the neck and hair and dragged around, the hostile spear yet sticking in his wound, with tracks of blood inscribed the dusty ground. Meantime the Trojan dames, oppressed with woe, to Pallas's fane in long procession go, in hopes to reconcile their heavenly foe. They weep, they beat their breasts, they rend their hair, and rich embroidered vests for presents spare, but the stern goddess stands unmoved with prayer. Thrice round the Trojan walls Achilles drew, the corpse of Hector whom in fight he slew. Here Priam sues, and there for sums of gold the lifeless body of his son is sold. So sad an object, and so well expressed, drew sighs and groans from the grieved hero's breast, to see the figure of his lifeless friend, and his old sire his helpless hand extend. Himself he saw amidst the Grecian train, mixed in the bloody battle on the plain, and swarthy Memnon in his arms he knew, his pompous ensigns and his Indian crew. Penthelicele, there, with haughty grace, leads to the wars an Amazonian race. In their right hands a pointed dart they wield, the left, for ward, sustains the lunar shield. Athwart her breast a golden belt she throws, amidst the press alone provokes a thousand foes, and dares her maiden arms to manly force oppose. Thus while the Trojan prince employs his eyes, fixed on the walls with wonder and surprise, the beauteous Dido with a numerous train, and pomp of guards ascends the sacred fane. Such on Utah's banks or Synthus' height, Diana seems, and so she charms the sight, when in the dance the graceful goddess leads, the choir of nymphs and overtops their heads. Known by her quiver and her lofty mien, she walks majestic and she looks their queen. Latona sees her shrine above the rest, and feeds with secret joy her silent breast. Such Dido was, with such becoming state, amidst the crowd she walks serenely great. Their labour to her future sway she speeds, and passing with a gracious glance proceeds then mounts the throne, high placed before the shrine, in crowds around the swarming peoples join. She takes petitions and dispenses laws, hears and determines every private cause. Their tasks in equal portions she divides, and where unequal there by lots decides. Another way by chance Aeneas bends, his eyes and unexpected sees his friends, Antheus, Sergestus, grave, Cloanthus, strong, and at their backs a mighty Trojan throng, whom late the tempest on the billows tossed, and widely scattered on another coast. The prince, unseen, surprised with wonder, stands, and longs with joyful haste to join their hands, but doubtful of the wished event he stays, and from the hollow cloud his friends surveys impatient till they told their present state, 
and where they left their ships, and what their fate, and why they came, and what was their request, for these were sent, commissioned by the rest, to sue for leave to land their sickly men, and gain admission to the gracious queen. Entering with cries they filled the holy fane, then thus with lowly voice Ilionius began. O queen, indulged by favour of the gods, to found an empire in these new abodes, to build a town with statutes to restrain the wild inhabitants beneath thy reign. We, wretched Trojans, tossed on every shore, from sea to sea, thy clemency implore. Forbid the fires our shipping to deface, receive the unhappy fugitives to grace, and spare the remnants of a pious race. We come not with design of wasteful prey, to drive the country, force the swains away. Nor such our strength, nor such is our desire. The vanquished dare not to such thoughts aspire. A land there is, Hesperia named of old. The soil is fruitful, and the men are bold. The Onotrians held at once by common fame, now called Italia from our leader's name. To that sweet region was our voyage bent, when winds and every warring element disturbed our course, and far from sight of land cast our torn vessels on the moving sand. The sea came on the south with mighty roar, dispersed and dashed the rest upon the rocky shore. Those few you see escaped the storm and fear unless you interpose a shipwreck here. What men, what monsters, what inhuman race, what laws, what barbarous customs of the place, shut up a desert shore to drowning men, and drive us to the cruel seas again. If our hard fortune no compassion draws, nor hospitable rights, nor human laws, the gods are just, and will revenge our cause. Aeneas was our prince, a juster lord, or nobler warrior, never drew a sword. Observant of the right, religious of his word, if yet he lives and draws this vital air, nor we, his friends, of safety shall despair. Nor you, great queen, these officers repent, which he will equal and perhaps augment. We want not cities, nor Sicilian coasts, where King Asetes' Trojan lineage boasts. Permit our ships a shelter on your shores, refitted from your woods with planks and oars, that, if our prince be safe, we may renew our destined course and Italy pursue. But if, O best of men, the fates ordain that thou art swallowed in the Libyan main, and if our young Lulus be no more, dismiss our navy from your friendly shore that we to good Ascetes may return, and with our friends our common losses mourn. Thus spoke Ilonaeus, the Trojan crew, with cries and clamours his request renew. The modest queen awhile, with downcast eyes, pondered the speech, then briefly thus replies, Trojans, dismiss your fears, my cruel fate, and doubts attending an unsettled state force me to guard my coast from foreign foes who has not the story of your woes the name and fortune of your native place the fame and valour of the phrygian race we tyrians are not so devoid of sense nor so remote from phoebus influence whether to latian shores your course is bent or driven by tempests from your first intent you seek the good Ascetes' government, your men shall be received, your fleet repaired, and sail with ships of convoy for your guard, or would you stay and join your friendly powers to raise and defend the Tyrian towers? My wealth, my city, and myself are yours, and would to heaven the storm you felt would bring on Carthaginian coasts your wandering king. My people shall, by my command, explore the ports and creeks of every winding shore, and towns and wilds and shady woods in quest of so renowned and so desired a guest. 
Raised in his mind the Trojan hero stood, And longed to break from out his ambient cloud. Ascates found it, and thus urged his way, From whence, O goddess born, this long delay? What more can you desire, your welcome sure, Your fleet in safety, and your friends secure? Only one wants, and him we saw in vain, Oppose the storm, and swallowed in the main. Orontes in his fate our forfeit paid, The rest agrees with what your mother said. Scarce had he spoken, when the cloud gave way, The mists flew upward and dissolved in day. The Trojan chief appeared in open sight, August in visage and serenely bright. His mother goddess, with her hands divine, Had formed his curling locks and made his temples shine, And given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace, And breathed a youthful vigour on his face, Like polished ivory, beauteous to behold, Or parry in marble when enchased in gold. Thus radiant from the circling cloud he broke, And thus with manly modesty he spoke. He whom you seek am I, by tempests tossed, And saved from shipwreck on your Libyan coast, Presenting gracious queen before your throne, A prince that owes his life to you alone. Fair majesty, the refuge and redress Of those whom fate pursues and wants oppress, You who your pious officers employ To save the relics of abandoned Troy. Receive the shipwrecked on your friendly shore, With hospitable rites relieve the poor. Associate in your town a wandering train, And strangers in your palace entertain. What thanks can wretched fugitives return, Who scattered through the world in exile mourn? The gods, if gods to goodness are inclined, If acts of mercy touch their heavenly mind, And more than all the gods, your generous heart, Conscious of worth, require its just desert. In you this age is happy, and this earth, And parents more than mortal gave you birth, While rolling rivers into seas shall run, And round the space of heaven the radiant sun, While trees the mountain tops with shades supply, Your honour, name, and praise shall never die. Whatever abode my fortune has assigned, Your image shall be present in my mind. Thus having said, he turned with pious haste, And joyful his expecting friends embraced. With his right hand Elonius was graced, Serestus with his left, then to his breast, Cloanthus and the noble Gaius pressed, And so by turns descended from the rest. The Tyrian queen stood fixed upon his face, Pleased with his motions, ravished with his grace, Admired his fortunes, more admired the man, Then recollected stood, and thus began. What fate, O goddess born, what angry powers Have cast you shipwrecked on our barren shores? Are you the great Aeneas, known to fame, Who from celestial seed your lineage claim? The same Aeneas, whom fair Venus bore, To famed Anchises on the Edean shore, It calls into my mind, though then a child, When Teusa came from Salamis exiled, And sought my father's aid to be restored, My father Belus then with fire and sword, Invaded Cyprus, made the region bare, And conquering finished the successful war. From him the Trojan siege I understood, The Grecian chiefs and your illustrious blood. Your foe himself the Dardan valour praised, And his own ancestry from Trojans raised. Enter, my noble guest, and you shall find, If not a costly welcome, yet a kind. For I myself, like you, have been distressed, Till heaven afforded me this place of rest. Like you, an alien in a land unknown, I learn to pity woes so like my own. She said, and to the palace led her guest, Then offered incest and proclaimed a feast, Nor yet less careful for her absent friends, 
twice ten fat oxen to the ships she sends, besides a hundred boars, a hundred lambs, with bleating cries attend their milky dams, and jars of generous wine and spacious bowls she gives to cheer the sailors' drooping souls. Now purple hangings clothe the palace walls, and sumptuous feasts are made in splendid halls. On Tyrian carpets richly wrought they dine, with loads of massy plate the sideboards shine, and antique vases, all of gold embossed, the gold itself inferior to the cost, of curious work where on the sides were seen the fights and figures of illustrious men, from their first founder to the present queen. The good Aeneas' paternal care, Ilulus' absence could no longer bear, dispatched Ashetes to the ships in haste, to give a glad relation to the past, and, fraught with precious gifts to bring the boy, snatched from the ruins of unhappy Troy, a robe of tissue stiff with golden wire, an upper vest once Helen's rich attire, from Argos by the famed adulteress brought, with golden flowers and winding foliage wrought, her mother leader's present when she came to ruin Troy and set the world on flame. The scepter Priam's eldest daughter bro bore, her orient necklace and the crown she wore, of double texture glorious to behold, one order set with gems and one with gold. Instructed thus, the wise Achates goes, and in his diligence his duty shows. But Venus, anxious for her son's affairs, new counsels tries and new designs prepares, that Cupid should assume the shape and face of sweet Ascanius and the sprightly grace, should bring the presence in her nephew's stead, and in Eliza's veins the gentle poison shed, for much she feared the Tyrians, double-tongued, and knew the town to Juno's care belonged. These thoughts by night her golden slumbers broke, and thus alarmed to winged love she spoke. My son, my strength, whose mighty power alone controls the thunderer on his awful throne, to thee thy much-afflicted mother flies, and on thy succour and thy faith relies. Thou knowest, my son, how Jove's revengeful wife by force and fraud attempts thy brother's life, and often hast thou mourned me with his pains, him Dido now with blandishment detains. But I suspect the town where Juno reigns, for this tis needful to protect her art, and fire with love the proud Venetian's heart, a love so violent, so strong, so sure, as neither age can change, nor art can cure. How this may be performed, now take my mind. Ascanius by his father is designed to come with presents laden from the port to gratify the queen and gain the court. I mean to plunge the boy in pleasing sleep and ravished in a daily and bowers to keep, or high Cythera that the sweet deceit may pass unseen, and none prevent the cheat. Take thou his form and shape, I beg the grace, but only for a night's revolving space. Thyself a boy, assume a boy dissembled face, that when, amidst the fervour of the feast, the Tyrian hugs and fonds thee on thy breast, and with sweet kisses in her arms constrains, thou mayst infuse thy venom in her veins. The god of love obeys, and sets aside his bow and quiver and his plumy pride. He walks Ilus in his mother's sight, and in the sweet resemblance takes delight. The goddess then to young Ascanius flies, and in a pleasing slumber seals his eyes, lulled in her lap amidst a train of loves, she gently bears him to her blissful groves, then with a wreath of myrtle crowns his head, and softly lays him on a flowery bed. Cupid, meantime, assumed his form and face, following Ashetes with a shorter pace, 
and brought the gifts the queen already saved amidst the Trojan lords in shining state. High on a golden bed, a princely guest was next her side in order sate the rest. Then canisters with bread are heaped on high, the attendants water for their hands supply, and having washed with silken towels dry, next filthy handmaids in long order bore. Fifty, the censers and with fumes the gods adore, then youths and virgins twice as many join, to place the dishes and to serve the wine. The Tyrian train admitted to the feast, approach and on the painted couches rest, all on the Trojan gifts with wonder gaze, but view the beauteous boy with more amaze. His rosy-coloured cheeks, his radiant eyes, his motions, voice and shape, and all the gods disguise, nor pass unpraised the vest and veil divine, which wandering foliage and rich flowers entwine. But far above the rest, the royal dame, already doomed to love's disastrous flame, with eyes ins insatiate and tumultuous joy, beholds the presence and admires the boy, the guileful god about the hero long, with children's play and false embraces hung, then sought the queen, she took him to her arms, with greedy pleasure, and devoured his charms. Unhappy Dido little thought what guest, how dire a god she drew so near her breast. But he, not mindless of his mother's prayer, works in the pliant bosom of the fair, and moulds her heart anew, and blots her former care. The dead is to the living love resigned, and all Aeneas enters in her mind. Now, when the rage of hunger was appeased, the meat removed, and every guest was pleased, the golden bowls with sparkling wine are crowned, and through the palace cheerful cries resound. From gilded roofs to pending lamps display nocturnal beams that emulate the day, a golden bowl that shone with gems divine, the queen commanded to be crowned with wine, the bowl that Bellus used, and all the Tyrian line. Then silence through the hall proclaimed she spoke. O hospitable Jove, we thus invoke, with solemn rites thy sacred name and power, bless to both nations this auspicious hour. So may the Trojan and the Tyrian line in lasting concord from this day combine. Thou, Bacchus, god of joys and friendly cheer, and gracious Juno, both be present here, and you, my lords of Tyre, your vows address to heaven with mine to ratify the peace. The goblet then she took, with nectar crowned, sprinkling the first libations on the ground, and raised it to her mouth with sober grace, then sipping, offered in the next in place, Twas Beteus whom she called, a thirsty soul, he took challenge and embraced the bowl, with pleasure swilled the gold, nor ceased to draw, till he the bottom of the brimmer saw. The goblet goes around, Eopas brought his golden lyre and sung what ancient Atlas taught, the various labours of the wandering moon, and whence proceed the eclipses of the sun the original of men and beasts, and whence the rains arise and fires their warmth dispense, and fixed and erring stars dispose their influence. What shakes the solid earth, what cause delays the summer nights and shortens winter days? With peals of shouts the Tyrians praise the song, those peals are echoed by the Trojan throng. The unhappy queen with talk prolonged the night, and drank large draughts of love with vast delight, of Priam much acquired, of Hector more, then asked what arms the swarthy Memnon wore, what troops he landed on the Trojan shore, the steeds of Diomede varied the discourse, and fierce Achilles with his matchless force, at length as fate and her ill stars required, to hear the series at the war desired. Relate at large, my godlike guest, she said, the Grecian stratagems, the town betrayed, 
the fatal issue of so long a war. Your flight, your wanderings, and your woes declare. For since on every sea, on every coast, your men have been distressed, your navy tossed, seven times the sun has either tropic viewed, the winter banished, and the spring renewed.